This video is sponsored by Skillshare. There will never be another airport quite like the one which served the Asian metropolis of Hong Kong in the years leading up to 1998. Hong Kong's old Kai Tak Airport is iconic among aviation enthusiasts, but was eventually closed due to rampant noise and air pollution and the large amount of land which it occupied right in the center of town. What made this airport so unique was the very interesting approach path that aircraft would take for landing on runway 13. Planes were guided towards a large hill, and with just a few hundred feet of altitude, would make a large banking turn over a densely populated area, just seconds before touching down on the runway. You see, planes couldn't make a straightened approach due to terrain limitations, and there was not a whole lot of flat space to put an airport here, as it was already built on partially reclaimed land. That steep turn on short final was made of the densely populated area of Kowloon. Hong Kong in the latter half of the 20th century became an economic powerhouse, making Kai Tak one of the busiest airports in the world. In fact, it once held the accolades of being the busiest airport in the world for cargo transportation and the busiest airport in the world with the use of a single runway. The large iconic planes of the 20th century, 747s, DC-10s, L-1011s and Concords were commonplace at Kai Tak and all made that same approach. As you would expect, the infamous IGS-13 approach was a challenging one. It was one that pilots had to have specific training to perform. This led to some complications, but despite this, no fatal accidents ever occurred in relation to this approach at Kai Tak. Though one plane crashed in 1988 on the reciprocal runway, no crash had ever occurred on the unconventional approach for runway 13. Except on one occasion, that is. On the morning of November 4th, 1993, a China Airlines Boeing 747 crashed at Kai Tak. In this video, we will break down the timeline of events which led to this incident and take a closer look at the airport and its infamous approach flight path. We learn more about this incident after a brief word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring, engaging, and creative classes for creative people. Skillshare has a bit of something for everyone. It's a platform I myself have used for numerous different creative endeavors. If you're watching this on YouTube, you may be interested in learning the skills to become a YouTuber yourself. Skillshare has got you covered there. With making videos being my full-time job, Skillshare has been a vital source for developing new skills, so I can't recommend them enough. I've been using the same video editing software for nearly 10 years now, and I think it might be due an upgrade. So I found Christopher Nevers' guide to DaVinci Resolve to be thoroughly enlightening. By joining Skillshare, you get instant access to thousands of classes curated for learning totally ad-free, and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused on your passions. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. China Airlines Flight 605 departed the city of Taipei and Taiwan at 6.30 a.m. for the morning flight to Hong Kong. It was expected to arrive in Hong Kong when adjusted for the time zone difference at around 7 a.m. local time. Taipei to Hong Kong was and still is one of the most traveled air routes in the world. 747s just like this one would make the two hour flight even though it was a short route for the 747. So many people made the trip that large planes like this were needed. China Airlines at the time had recently acquired some of the new 747-400s the then latest variant of the plane. At the time of the Flight 605 incident, there had never been a hull loss of the type. In the cockpit were just two pilots. The new 400 variant of the 747 had eliminated the flight engineer from the flight deck. The names of the pilots, however, seemed to not be of public knowledge. We know that the captain was 47 years of age and had previously flown in the Taiwanese Air Force before being hired by China Airlines in 1984. 
he had a total flying experience amounting to over 12,000 flight hours. The co-pilot was much younger, at 37 years of age. He had just under 1,000 hours logged in the 747, though his total flying experience amounted to well over 5,000 hours by the time of the Hong Kong accident. Both pilots had flown into Kai Tak numerous times, and according to the accident report, made the landing multiple times a month. Both pilots had also recently attended crew resource management courses and so were well equipped as professional pilots. In the cabin were 20 flight attendants along with 274 passengers. A category 4 typhoon named Ira had been passing through this region of Asia. Originating in the Pacific Ocean, the storm reached its peak intensity when it struck the Philippines. The typhoon was later downgraded into a tropical storm as it approached southern China and Hong Kong. Despite the storm tapering off in intensity, the weather it brought was still certainly not ideal flying weather. Crosswinds had been brought to Kai Tak, which made the already challenging approach more precarious. The actual weather observed at the airport that morning measured winds at around 17 knots, coming from 070, gusting upwards of 30 knots. Visibility was still well within the safe limits at 7 kilometers, with forecasted rain. All weather observations that morning reported wind shear, which is a rapid change in wind direction over a short distance, which can pose a threat to aircraft. The approach into Kai Tak first started for Flight 605 by passing the airport to the south. The plane needed to intercept the Chung Chow or Charlie Hotel VOR, located around 11 nautical miles southwest of the airport. From there, the approach path is directed another half dozen or so miles to the west, where planes pass over the west side of Lantau Island, before making a large right turn, passing over the site of Hong Kong's new modern Cheplap Kok Airport. There is another ground-based navigational aid located here if necessary. The approach path at this point would put aircraft in a position similar to that of any other modern airport, that is, in an ideal position to intercept a localizer. The localizer and instrument landing system at Kai Tak differed greatly from that of a normal airport, because the localizer was not located at the airport. Again, to emphasize, this was not a straightened approach. Therefore, a solution needed to be devised to work around the tough terrain of Hong Kong. The what was called Instrument Guidance System, or IGS, was set up so that the localizer would actually bring aircraft in from the west deliberately lined up with terrain and descending as if it were approaching a runway at any other airport. The heading difference between the runway heading and IGS approach heading was 47 degrees. Planes still needed to make that final turn to line up for runway 13, so a large checkerboard decorated the side of a large hill. If by the time they reached the middle marker they could see the checkerboard, pilots would then bank their planes to the right at this point and land on runway 13. It's because of this that the approach is sometimes called the checkerboard approach. As Flight 605 was on final approach flying towards the checkerboard in Hong Kong, visibility had decreased to 5 kilometers, and another aircraft ahead of them, a McDonnell Douglas MD-80, had made a safe landing. In their landing clearance, the tower appended information pertaining to the weather. This reminded the flight crew to expect wind shear on final and that crosswinds were now in excess of 25 knots. The pilots performed the before landing checklist, which included configuring the plane for landing. The flaps in this regard were set to 30 degrees and the reference airspeed or VREF was set to 140 knots. The speed brakes were also set to the armed position. This means that they will automatically deploy once the plane touches down on the runway. During the IGS approach, Flight 605 encountered significant turbulence, which was complemented by rainfall. The captain disconnected the autopilot at 1,000 feet to fly the landing manually. According to the accident report, the captain had difficulty in reading the airspeed on their display. The primary flight display on the 747-400 has the attitude indicator, airspeed indicator and altitude integrated on one display. Large fluctuations in airspeed were observed. The co-pilot was able to help and the problem was rectified. A wind shear alert sounded just moments before the sharp right turn. The ground proximity warning system and glide slope warnings were also heard. The GPWS often sounded on the IGS approach due to the close proximity of the terrain. Despite the warnings the plane was giving to the pilots, the tower controller noted that the plane appeared to be in a normal position at this stage in the approach. 
As routine, the plane banked and lined up with the runway and touched down on runway 13, around 480 meters beyond the runway threshold. As expected, the speed brakes are deployed as the plane's nose was lowered to the ground. The co-pilot applied some aileron to counter the crosswind. Around 2-3 seconds after touching down, the captain, instead of moving the throttles into reverse, had actually pushed forward on all four. This effectively tripped a switch that turned off the auto brake and retracted the speed brakes. The auto brake and speed brakes in combination with the reverse thrust are two components that are supposed to help a pilot decelerate their plane on a runway. The plane began a very small roll to the left, though the plane was on the ground. For a period of around 7 seconds, the pilots would struggle with the left rolling the plane was encountering. They were, however, able to arrest this effect and regain control. The co-pilot then notes to the captain that the auto brake was not engaged and that the reverse thrust had not been selected. The pilots slammed their foots on the brakes but noticed that there was now not enough room for the plane to stop at their current speed. Because the runway at Kai Tak was built on reclaimed land, it stretches out into Kowloon Bay. The pilots attempted to turn the plane to the left off of the runway. However, China Airlines Flight 605 overran the end of runway 13 where it crashed into the shallow water of Kowloon Bay. According to the CVR transcript, the splash of water could apparently be heard. The air traffic controller in the tower immediately activated the crash alarm, alerting the fire and rescue teams who were already put on standby due to the weather. Whilst they were mobilizing on both ground and water, on board the plane, the pilots were running through the shutdown and evacuation checklists. The captain had attempted to contact the cabin through the interphone system, but the system had already ceased functioning. One flight attendant had made their way to the flight deck, where the evacuation order was given. The crash had injured at least 10 people. However, some sources are conflicting, stating that up to two dozen people could have been injured. Incredibly, though this was the first hull loss of the 747-400, there were no fatalities. The damage to the plane was extensive, and it was pulled out of the water where this photograph was taken a few days after the incident. Images of the plane in the aftermath would suggest that damage was done to the tail fin. This was, however, removed after the incident. The tail fin was interfering with airport operations and the instrument landing system attributed to runway 31, where planes would make the more straightened approach over Kowloon Bay. The tail fin was blown off with dynamite. The investigation concluded the obvious and put this crash down to pilot error, highlighting that the captain deviated from the normal landing rollout procedure by inadvertently advancing the thrust levers, where he should have selected the reverse. Though pilot error was a causal factor, the China Airlines operations manual was also highlighted in that there was not adequate guidance for operations in difficult weather. Kai Tak Airport closed in July of 1998, being replaced by the newer airport at Cheblap Kok. The site of Kai Tak is still under redevelopment nearly 25 years later. One of the last remnants of the old airport that remains to this day is the large checkerboard which sat on the side of that hill crumbling away for over 20 years. It recently was restored and continues to serve as a reminder of the site's history. Flight 605 remained only one of two hull losses to occur at the airport during its years of operation. Except not quite, as that does, however, depend on how you define that statistic. Though we briefly touched on it in the Japan Airlines Flight 123 video, I would be remiss if I did not mention this here. On February 7, 1980, a different China Airlines 747, this time an older 200 model, landed in Kai Tak, performing the same IGS approach we have already discussed. The aircraft suffered a tail strike on landing damaging part of the plane's skin on the underside of the tail section, which had scraped the surface of runway 13. A repair of the plane was carried out, but not in accordance with Boeing's structural repair manual. 22 years later, on May 25, 2002, nearly four years after Kai Tak closed, that same plane disintegrated in flight due to metal fatigue, induced by the structural damage the plane sustained landing at Kai Tak all those years ago. 225 people were killed on board China Airlines Flight 611. Hello everyone, I hope you're having a good day wherever you are in the world. 
I was really happy with how this video turned out, so if you enjoyed it or found it to be interesting, be sure to subscribe as there is always a new video every Saturday. Kaitak Airport is, or was, a place that really fascinates me, and I'm really sad that I will never get to see it as it was in the before times. So I was very much in my element in making this video. Anyway, it's the time of the week where I must thank my patrons over on Patreon for the amazing support. If you would like to have your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. Patrons also get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes up publicly on YouTube. So a thank you to my £5 tier patrons, Avery Teoda, Hunter Heilman, Hector Palmatellas, Joey, John Ambrosia, a new joiner, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morins, Christy, Leon San Jennings, Marie Innes, MG, Mom Left Me at Best Buy, Pacman 7, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, Rio Wheatley, Soria Melody, Sleepy, So FP, and Sue 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 Shoes. Oh god, Sue is back. Thanks to my 10 pound tier patrons for the supremely generous support Ada Montgomery, Anne Sid, Bod Ghost Isu, Derek Bean, Aaron Wilson, who recently updated their Patreon up to 10 pounds, so thank you very much, Espalon, Extreme Brooklyn Accent, James Bluke, Karma, Mike Milton, Roger Mayer, Steve Cottrell, and Where Are My Cheetos? Thank you all so very much. And that is it from me this week. I hope you have a good weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.